Hello all, I've been asked by Tony Thorpe to put together a video giving you the basic overview of mobile cranes and mobile crane operations. Working in the construction industry, it's very likely that you'll be involved in the mobile crane operation at some point in your career. This video will hopefully give you the foundational knowledge you will need to interact with these operations. Throughout this video, I'm going to use the term mobile crane to describe the cranes we're looking at. But please be aware that the term mobile crane is kind of a catch-all term for all self-propelled cranes. It encompasses many different variants. The most relevant to the UK industry will be the all-terrain cranes and crawler cranes. All-terrain cranes are one of the more common types of crane within the UK. They are capable of driving on both highways and off-road site conditions. They typically use hydraulic booms. However, extreme capacity models will utilize lattice-based booms as well. The capacities of these cranes can range from about five ton to an excess of a thousand ton. The other type of mobile crane you are likely to encounter are crawler cranes. These cranes utilize a crawler-based undercarriage and typically have lattice-based booms. However, lower capacity crawler cranes may also use hydraulic booms, similar to that on all-terrain cranes. Crawler cranes with lattice booms are capable of incredibly heavy lifts. However, they take much longer to rig and require support of additional transport and support cranes during mobilization. Going forward, I'll be using an all-terrain crane as my visual example, but a lot of the concepts we will cover will be transferable onto different types of mobile cranes. When talking about mobile cranes, it's important to be able to identify the main components. Starting from the bottom, we have the undercarrier. It's essentially referring to everything below the slewing ring, the truck part of the crane, basically. Atop the slewing ring sits the upper carrier of the mobile crane. This includes the cabin, counterweight, and their associated support structures. The main boom connects to the upper carrier via the boom pin and the hydraulic luffing cylinders. The main boom itself is made up of a number of telescopic sections. The number of these sections depends on the crane model. Also note that in some cases, this may not be a hydraulic boom and instead be a fixed length lattice structure. However, these tend to be more common on crawler cranes and all-terrain cranes with capacities in excess of 750 ton. If extra capacity is needed, a superlift can be added to the boom to greatly increase crane capacities by adding additional support to the main boom and minimizing boom deflection under load. If extra reach is needed, a fixed fly can be added to the main boom. These additional lattice sections provide additional reach and can be set at various fixed angles. Note that the angle of the fixed fly cannot be changed when the hook is under load. A superlift can also be added to this configuration to increase capacities. For situations where extreme reach is needed, a luffing jib can be used. Unlike a fly jib, the angle of this jib can be altered when loaded, but it requires the main boom to be locked into a specific angle. Again, a superlift can be added to increase capacities. This next section will be concentrating on the common operational constraints inherent in mobile crane operations. To illustrate these factors, I will be using a program called Liebherr Lift Platter 2.0. If you wish to play around with this software yourself, a free variant of this software is available from Liebherr's website. A link to the page can be found in the video description below. Here I have set up a very basic and highly fictional lift operation using a mobile crane. The crane is flanked by buildings to the north and east of its position and it's lifting a load weighing 50 tonnes. Using this simple operation it is easy to highlight some of the main constraints that must be considered when planning a lifting operation. The main factors that need to be considered are a. The crane selection b. The positioning of the crane c. Proximity to any obstructions d. The safe working load or overloading and e. Ground conditions Starting with factor a, the crane selection is the most important stage of planning a crane operation as a suitable crane must be selected for the operation. An undersized crane may not be able to complete the operation, whereas an oversized crane may cost more money than is necessary and take longer to rig and derig. There are several factors in crane selection that need to be considered. A. The weight of the load to be lifted. B. The height to which the load is to be lifted. C. The radius to which the load is to be lifted. D. The terrain of the site. And E the availability of cranes from local crane hire companies. With this sample lift plan, we are going to assume that this crane is the most suitable for the job in hand. The positioning of a crane can significantly affect the operation. If a crane is situated closer to the load, pickup and laydown positions, a smaller crane can be used, and such is the opposite is true. 
However, this is not always possible as obstructions may be present on site, or space may be limited, meaning that there is no flexibility in the crane position. The crane position must also be reviewed concerning other site activities, as the crane's position can effectively neutralise a portion of an active site, thus delaying other activities until the operation is complete. The positioning of a mobile crane can directly link into all aspects of an operation and can actively define the crane selection process. Again, with this simple lift plan, we are going to assume that this position is the only position available for the crane. Any operation using a mobile crane must be planned in a way that ensures that there is sufficient headroom and space for the outriggers. In addition to this, proximity to hazards such as overhead cables, excavations, underground services and public highways or railways must also be considered. When considering proximity, you must consider both the upper and lower carrier of the mobile crane, as well as the main boom and any extensions. As you have just seen, the crane is able to freely rotate through 90 degrees without clashing with any obstruction. However, this is not true for the full 360 degree rotation of the crane. If the crane is rotated further than 90 degrees, the main boom will clash with the tower of the northern building. Alternatively, if the crane rotates 90 degrees the other way, the counterweight will also clash with the northern building. This can be remedied a number of ways, the most obvious being the relocation of the crane. However, this may not be possible given the crane's capacity, reach or the on-site space. The other method would be to physically limit the crane from slewing in a way that would cause a clash. This can be done through careful monitoring by on-site banksmen or by putting slewing limiters on the crane. Whatever method is chosen, it must be clearly detailed on the crane plan and communicated to the site team. Now we will look at safe working loads. Generally, as the lifting radii of a mobile crane increases, the available capacity decreases. As we can see from the panel on the right, we are currently using 85% of the crane's available capacity. If we reduce the lifting radius, the available capacity increases and the capacity utilization decreases. However, if we increase the radius, the opposite happens. If we increase the radius too far, the crane will become overloaded and either structurally fail or overturn. This is called overloading. The overloading of a crane must be avoided at all costs. The highest anticipated load weights should always take precedent over any lower estimations and the weight of the rigging and hook block should also be considered at the final weight. Loads should not be dragged, lifting submerged loads should be avoided if possible and a capacity contingency should always be provided. All these facts and any assumptions made must be communicated on any detailed lift plan. Finally, we move on to ground conditions. A working mobile crane puts significant forces into the ground. If you look at the bottom section of the right-hand panel, you can see the current outrigger loads. These loads currently show point loads, as no matting has been detailed for the current crane. As the crane rotates, you can see the outrigger loads changing. This is due to the combined centre of gravity of the crane and load changing as the upper carrier rotates. A worst case outrigger load is usually produced when lifting directly over an outrigger. As previously mentioned, the loads shown in this program are point loads and therefore will probably require additional matting to spread out the load. The amount of load spreading required is dependent on the underlying ground conditions. Care must be taken to minimize bearing pressure on underlying services or voids. Additional care must be taken on ground near embankments or on soft ground. If the loads imposed by the crane are higher than what the ground can handle, the results can be catastrophic. My plan with this video was to give you an overview of mobile cranes and the associated planning constraints. I hope you have found this video useful. If you wish to learn more about mobile cranes, I have linked a number of useful videos in the description below. I would also recommend the book Cranes and Derricks by Howard and Jay Shapiro. This will also be linked below. Again, I hope this video has been somewhat useful and I thank you for your time.